however you get any question that is slightly open then manage to stay calm whether it's a bouncer or a googly i'm calm i'm just a normal human being all the others who have taken to self imposed crippling uh aspects to their life they are all thinking i am something very special is ramayana and mahabharat real or was it just a story this human story in some way should uh, write a few things within you should inspire you to do something about your life but today it is all factual you know ah uh, 1452 this battle happened 1566 that battle happened what are you going to do with it there is no nutrient in the soil that means death for most of the populations we have this challenge and we have this privilege that if we can turn the life on this planet back from its brink to a safer place or we can let it pass so uh, namaskaram sadguru namaskaram sadguru namaskaram both of you namaskar Okay. Uh, so the first question that I have for you is that whenever you get any question that is slightly open sense or that is trigger that is targeted in such a way to get a reaction from you, you manage to stay calm. That is one quality that you have that I really want to, us to have as well because we are really new to social media. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't stay calm uh, only because uh, something is a bouncer question. I'm just calm. Whether it's a bouncer or a googly, I'm calm. Not because of that question, or not to attend to that particular question. I'm like this. Okay. Why I'm like this is, see, essentially, what you call as reaction is that your faculties don't function the way you want. Your thought, your emotion, your speech does not function the way you want. well that is called crippled hello if you can't use your hands the way you want if you can't use your head the way you want it's a crippling experience isn't it so uh, i'm just a normal human being who knows how to use his thought his emotion his energy his hands his legs the way he wants all the others who have taken to self imposed crippling uh aspects to their life they are all thinking i am something very special no this is how a human being should be because you are the only creature on the planet who is referred to as a being no other creature is referred to as a being why you are referred to as a human being is you are supposed to know how to be if you knew how to be would you keep yourself blissful or miserable that's all i am doing <laughs> so uh, the next question we have is that uh, a lot of students are facing a lot of stress right now because of their exams so just the way you manage to stay calm in stressful situations like uh, i mean of course this is not a stressful situation but this is something that is happening beyond what is planned so whenever uh, like mike tyson mike tyson had this quote that everything goes as per the plan until the first punch lands on your face So what what does a what should a person do when things are not going according to the plan especially students uh the examination is not supposed to go according to your plan your education should go according to your plan the examination is always supposed to be a surprise question for you otherwise what's the point of examination all right so uh, the problem is we are thinking examination is a problem the problem is we are doing something that we are not interested in largely most people are not interested in doing that because this is large scale education everybody should go through academics everybody should read physics chemistry mathematics you know biology this is not a reality this is not an intellectual reality in the world not everybody is designed for that somebody may do well with music somebody may do well with something else but there is no such opportunity everybody is going through the same stuff so different shapes of people are all put through the same extruder so there is a certain amount of pain if we know what we are reading if we are interested in the subject we won't be reading the syllabus we'll be reading something beyond that isn't it so examination would be a play 
But right now, examination is such a big uh, stress for everybody, because first of all, through the year, they're doing something they don't much care for. Everybody is going through education not because of the longing to learn, because somebody has told them, if you do this, you will can get this much money, if you do this, you can have this kind of lifestyle. So, because of that, they're doing it. So, naturally, they will suffer the process. So, this is very important. In yoga, we say like this, if you have one eye on the goal, you will have only one eye to find your way, and it's very hard, inefficient. If you use both your eyes to find the way, depending on your competence and the fire within you, you will go as far as you go naturally. So, this problem is this westernized way of being goal-oriented, they're dedicated to the goal. This is something I'm changing here with our people. Here, people are devoted to the process. If you do the process well, the goal will happen. Now, you're only wanting the goal, you want the mango, but you don't want the mango tree. Uh, this will cause lot of suffering <laughs> Very true. Uh, speaking of a tree, uh, a lot of times people say that our education system is trying to disconnect us from our roots, especially when it comes to ancient Indian epics such as Ramayana and Mahabharata. Now, there are great leadership lessons that are there in Rama and Mahabharata that used to be taught to kings so that uh, we can make better leaders out of them. So, a lot of times the conversation gets stuck at this particular question that is Ramayana and Mahabharata real or was it just a story constructed to uh, guide us into our future? So, what are your thoughts about it? Whatever happened in your life yesterday, if you tell somebody, it is a story, isn't it? Whether it's an interesting story or a boring story, that's the only question, but it's a story. So, even uh, <laughs> I'm playing on the words, his story means they left her out. <laughs> his story, it is <laughs> So, <laughs> what happened to people in those times? The stories are said to people from generation to generation, Context changing slightly according to the generational requirement. This is a flexibility we have in this country, which the Western way of looking at life, just facts are important. I'm asking you, people are debating about this, you know. Uh, if, uh, if Krishna was born in Uttar Pradesh, how come he was dark? Probably they got it all wrong, or maybe he's a South Indian man. This is silly. I'm saying whether Krishna was dark, he had a nose or not, what is your problem? Our problem is what he inspires within you, the character. You don't know him, all right? The character that we call as Krishna, what does he inspire within you? But look at the Western aspect of history. Simply this year, this happened, that year, that happened, this guy killed that guy. That is not what we want to know. What happened in people's minds and hearts? What inspired them to do the right things and the wrong things? What drove them? Because this is a human story. This human story in some way should uh, write a few things within you, should inspire you to do something about your life. This is the idea of history in this country. But today it is all factual, you know. Ah, 1452, this battle happened, 1566, that battle happened. What are you going to do with it? You can pass a stupid examination, that's all. In what way is it relevant to your life that this king killed that king, that happened, this happened, this happened, what does it mean? Unless we know what was happening in their minds, why they did what they did, so these are poignant stories. Well, anything that happened day before yesterday, you can believe your father did not exist after some time. All the best. <laughs> because nobody told you much about your father, after he's gone, you can believe maybe he did not exist, because there's no proof. There's no proof. But this is a silly way of looking at life. These are living stories which have lived in this country. Well, exaggerations might have happened, enhancement might have happened, edits might have happened. Uh, people might have pushed it and pulled it according to their needs. Yes, they have done all that. 
But the central part of the story is his story in this country, all right? Mm. But unfortunately, anything that is beyond three thousand years in the world, people are calling it as mythology. No, no. <laughs> That's true. Uh, so, Sadhguruji, uh, I've heard uh, that you have a Save the Soil, Save Our Soil campaign right now. So, can you just tell us what is this very grave crisis regarding soil that we are facing right now? See, uh, every responsible scientist is pointing out, the UN agencies have clearly stated, we have only sixty to eighty harvests left in the planet. That means somewhere between forty-five to fifty or fifty-five years. After that, we don't have the ability to grow food on the land because there is no nutrient in the soil. Why did such a thing happen? Simply because soil is not dead material where you can throw some nitrogen, phosphorus, something and make it happen, it's a living entity. A handful of soil has eight to ten billion organisms in… in one handful of soil. So that is more than the human population, I'm saying. But we have let it die. How did this happen? Because of industrial level of agriculture, where there is no organic input into the soil. Organic input is the food for all these organisms, so that they thrive and in turn they exchange nutrients with the plants and plants in turn cap capture carbon and make carbon sugars and exchange with the microbes. We must understand this microbial life is the basis of our existence. Even uh, evolutionary uh, part of it, in, the, in, the, in terms of evolution, we are just a reflection of what is be happening within, uh, beneath our feet. The microbial activity there is what is happening here and uh, only forty percent of your body has genetic content from your parentage. The remaining part is all microbes, sixty percent you are a microbial life <laughs> You know, between the two of you, you can call each other some species <laughs> which is dominant <laughs> Good idea, good idea, I don't remember that <laughs> So, uh, this is the same thing happening in the soil on a much larger scale. Today, everybody knows this, without the gut microbiome, you cannot digest the food that you eat. The same is true in the soil, the plant cannot get the nutrients that it wants without the help of the microbes, because those microbes is the ba are the basis of life on this planet. And on an average, twenty-seven thousand species of microbes are going extinct per year, according to UNFAO. On an average, they're saying twenty-seven thousand species, not organisms, going extinct. If it goes at this rate, in about thirty to forty years, we will reach a point where we cannot grow food, and if we try to regenerate the soil at that time, it will take hundred and fifty to two hundred years. That means death for most of the populations. But today, if we attempt this now, now if we take the necessary action by enshrining soil regeneration and ecological regeneration as a part of our national policies across the world, then in ten to fifteen or maximum twenty years' time, we can make a significant turnaround. So as a generation, we have this challenge and we have this privilege that if we can turn the life on this planet back from its brink to a safer place or we can let it pass. I thought we should not let it pass. So I am sixty-five years of age and now I am riding thirty thousand kilometers from London to Kaveri Basin. Uh, you know, thirty thousand kilometers is not a joy ride. But I am doing this because I want people to understand it's that urgent. It is that urgent. People are saying, oh, why should you do this? I'm saying, why would you not do it, I'm asking. This is the first time that we can sit here and talk to millions of people in the world, all right? When we have such a capability, we have to activate this. To bring this into policy, we want to move anywhere between three to four billion people. To speak about soil, now it's not necessary everybody should support me or whatever. From March twenty-first for one hundred days, everybody should talk about soil for hundred days. If you do that, we will aggregate these numbers on the social media platforms and come to a place where if three to four billion people have spoken about soil, 
no government is going to ignore it because in a democratic nation, the only currency that flies is numbers and that numbers we need to create. The reason why governments are not investing in long-term well-being of the planet and the nation is people have not spoken. People need to speak. People need to understand the most powerful thing that you have in a democratic nation is your vote and your voice. Vote, I don't know what you have done with it, at least your voice. Speak up for hundred days, spend five, ten minutes, five minutes a day is enough. Every day, five minutes a day, just on all the platforms that you can speak, just say something. If you don't, we will provide enormous material on our website. You can pick it up and use it as yours. If you don't even know that, just say, save soil, let's make it happen. Every day. In the end of every video of ours, we have a small section called Hum Kya Kar Sakta, in which we encourage people some small level actions that they can do in their everyday lives uh, for betterment uh, of this particular issue. Like our objective is to make India and the world one percent better because we have to believe that at an individual level as well, we can take some actions that will contribute and uh, aggregate towards something big. So. Uh, for somebody like us who stays in cities or for somebody who uh, is in the villages, like a farmer, what do you think what we can do to uh, help this cause in the sense, uh, help soil stay alive for longer? See, right now, if everybody gets to run around and try to fix the soil, it's not going to work. It has to become a part of the policy. Which city do you live in? Mumbai. Mumbai. You're in Mumbai. Today there are laws, suppose you have a five thousand square feet plot in Mumbai city, you can't build five thousand square feet of building. You have to build two, three, three thousand or something and leave some space for yourself, your neighbor, something there is a law. You can't build according to whatever you think. But uh, there are parts of Mumbai, let's say you went to Dharavi. If you go there, homes have been built where there is no concept of a window. There is one door entry, one door, same door out, same door in, same door out. Because everywhere people have built whichever way they know. Why this happened? Because there is no law about it. This is what the difference is between having a policy and not having a policy. Right now, if you have ten acres of land, you can plow every inch of it, use it whichever way you want. In ten, fifteen years, you can turn it into a desert. There is no law even to ask you, why are you doing this? A law is needed because seventy-one percent of the world's land is under agriculture. If you don't make a law, how an agricultural land should be kept, then we are heading for a super disaster, okay? We are looking at massive famines in the next five to ten years' time in many parts of the world. UN agencies are clearly saying by 2035, you can expect dozens of civil wars around the world because of food shortages. By 2045, we are producing forty percent less food and our population will be over nine billion. That's not a world we want to live in. That's not a world where we want to leave our children and go. So this is very important and above all, this is a cusp of time where we have an opportunity to turn it around. If we don't turn this around now, we will regret seriously in the next couple of decades. So about young people, what can they do? Should they go and fix their garden? Yes, that is their business, they must do it. But that is not the important thing right now. The important thing is one hundred days, say something about soil, raise your voice about it. That is what makes the difference. Namaskar. Uh, just one last request, Sadhguru. We end each video by this one line and that's the reason why so, uh, if you could say that line, that would be great. Well, <laughs> well uh, that is the reason we need to make it happen. Let's make it happen. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.